Good morning. And welcome on this first Sunday with di Daylight Saving Time. There's a lot of controversy about Daylight Saving Time. And I'm glad all of you have made it up the, uh, with, the, with one less hour. It's good to have you here. You all received a goldenrod colored questionnaire about senior ministry here at the church. Please fill it out and return it to one of the ushers as you leave. Also, and I want to thank Carol Tindera and her committee for organizing this. We are forming the committee as, as I speak. So if you'd like to work on a senior ministry program, a talk with Carol. We're glad to have more people. Also, I want to tell, remind you that next Sunday is One Great Hour of Sharing. One Great Hour of Sharing offering is almost 70 years old. It began after World War II as a way to respond to disasters, both natural and human-made, and also to help resettle refugees and all of that. The offering works year-round. It's one of the first offerings to be sent and one of the last offerings to leave an area. And it's very well managed. It's up in the upper 90 per 90s percent for efficiency. So you can give it with confidence. And are there any, any other announcements to be shared this morning? If not, let us prepare our hearts and our minds to worship God.
you, Jennifer, for that beautiful rendition. It's gorgeous. Please rise if you're able and join me in the call to worship. Our souls are thirsting for God. Our spirits are longing for love. We come with our brokenness and loss, with our hopes to be made whole. We come to the one who knows all our secrets, who brings peace to all of us and each of us. Please join me in the prayer of confession. Powerful, gentle God, you can take desert waste and make it grow into fruitful land. We need your power to change life. Our lives are so often full of drudgery. Often we forget to live thankful lives and get bogged down in self-pity and blame. Empower us, God. Help us to feel your spirit changing us each day, that our lives may be full and glowing in your love. Through the spirit whose breath sustains us, we pray. Amen. The good news that as far as the east is from the west, so far does God remove our transgressions from us. For there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen.
Would the children please come forward at this time? Helen has a special message for each of you. So come on up and sit around Helen there. to you guys today about it's called one can you hear me oh, that's better one great hour of sharing so first of all I want to ask you have you ever well Brittany I know you're involved in Girl Scouts and you just sold Girl Scout cookies right so that was a fundraiser so you were raising money to help the Girl Scout organization right have you ever done a project like you sold candy for school or um, so those are fundraisers, right? Where you're selling stuff to, to raise money for a good, good cause. I've never done that, though. You've never done that? Believe me, it'll be in your future. Yeah, yeah, yeah you will do that. So um, one great hour of sharing is coming up next weekend, and we're going to try to, we won't be selling anything, but we're hoping that people will just donate money for this good cause. But, you know, I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm getting a little thirsty. Would you mind holding this? Okay. Yeah. Got it? Okay. I'm going to drink of water. Right back here. So, I'm kind of thirsty. I'm going to pour some water out. So. Okay, but where are my manners? Would you like a drink of water? Would you like a drink of water? If you want a drink of water? Well, it looks kind of yucky, right? Here, so I'm going to hold this. So maybe, maybe you don't want to share that so much, huh? It's kind of yucky. Oh, that's awfully sweet of you. But you can stay right here. That's okay. We'll get that later, all right? Good job, Spencer. So, I'm also kind of hungry. I didn't eat any breakfast. Would you like to share some bread? No, thanks. Pick up a piece and see what you think. It's too hard, isn't it? It's dry. You want to feel a piece? <laughs> I should have put it in the freezer or the fridge. Yeah, it's kind of not that tasty, right? So we'll put that aside too. So, but, you know, there are a lot of people in the world that don't have clean water or they don't have food to eat or it's stale like that, you know. So then you can try to get some water in the mud and does water are always clean forever and ever. Right. So what one great hour, hour of sharing is helps get people clean water. Then you can't get it from the moats since moats are sea because they go from sea. You don't want to drink, yeah, dirty water, right? Because that can make you sick. Yeah. So um, one great hour of sharing helps to get clean water for people and helps get food for people. But what of the whole live world didn't have any water and then how would we get drinks of water if we eat water? They wouldn't have any drinks, well, drinks of water that they could, I wouldn't want to drink that, right? Yeah. So what we're going to do, be eat bugs? No, I wouldn't want to eat bugs, huh? So what I'm going to give you guys, it's kind of like a little box with a hole in the top. It's almost like a little piggy bank, right? Right. So what we're going to do is have you, you can put maybe, a, if you get allowance, you can put the money in there to donate part of that. Oh, or I would ask your mom and dad. Yeah. Oh, or your grandma and grandpa or your aunts and uncles. Yeah. Oh, coins. coins in there. Yeah. And we're going to collect. We're going to bring that back next Sunday. And that will be our day of everybody 
donating into that one great hour of sharing to give food and water for people who don't have it, right? And I'll start it. See, I have my little envelope here, so I'm going to be the first one. I'll do it this week and make that donation this week. So you think you can do that for this week? Just put some coins in there and bring that back next week? You can give it a try? Okay. Awesome. Okay. Great. Well, thank you so much. I might not be able to get 300 coins for Disney. Oh, I bet your mom will have some coins. Yeah, she can help. And your dad, yeah, they can help you out. All right, so let's close by saying a prayer, okay? Dear God, please get the everybody in the church. Please get everyone in the church. To donate to one great hour of sharing. To donate to one great hour of sharing. To help all the people who don't have clean water and food. To help all the people who don't have clean water and food. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Thanks so much, guys. So bring that back next Sunday, okay? Our scripture lesson today comes from Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. And this passage is about finding peace with God through Christ. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand. And we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. For while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us in that while we still were sinners, Christ died for us. Much more surely then, now that we have been justified by his blood, will we be saved through him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God, through the death of his son, much more surely, having been reconciled, will we be saved by his life. But more than that, we even boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Our second reading comes from John chapter 4, verses 4 through 26. But he had to go through Samaria. This is about Jesus returning to Galilee from Judea. And in Sychar, he meets a Samaritan woman by the well. This is a story you probably are all familiar with. So he came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. 
the woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw the water. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship, worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will com proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. This ends our reading. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Jesus is thirsty. He's hot, he's tired, he's weary, and so he sits down. He sits down, as Carolyn just read, next to Jacob's well. Now this is full of historical significance, and the people who heard it for the first time will picture Jacob meeting Rachel at the well at noontime in one of those chance opportunities that was really providential and they have a little flirtation and we know that that leads to a marriage. And Sychar has another name, that's Shechem, and Shechem is where Joshua gathered the Israelites and called on them to renew their covenant with God and said to them in Joshua chapter 24, Choose this day whom you will serve. Will it be the God of your ancestors in Egypt who worshiped other gods, or will it be Yahweh? And Joshua says, I and my household will worship Yahweh. So this is freighted with historical memories. And Jesus is really tired because he's just had that night that conversation at nighttime with Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a Pharisee and an influential Jewish leader. He is well credentialed and he has a name. He's remembered even now. But this next encounter is with a Samaritan woman, an outsider, the exact opposite of Nicodemus. And she has no name, she's just known as a Samaritan woman, a nobody, a somebody, but not a memorable person, except her story is still told on the third Sunday of every Lent. 
And Jesus decides he wants to go home. He wants to go home to Galilee, but he has to travel through, excuse me, my throat's dry this morning. He must travel through enemy territory, Samaria, in order to get to Galilee. And as he's traveling, he stops at the well. You see, Jews and Samaritans feuded over which was the holiest of all places. Was it Jerusalem or was it Gerizim in, in Samaria? And those areas are still being argued about because Samaria is now called the West Bank in the Palestinian territory of Israel, and Jerusalem is in Jewish Israel, and also the Muslims and the Christians like to claim Jerusalem. It's high noon, and as she comes to him, they have this little flirtatious conversation because he's thirsty for clean drinking water, and, but she's thirsty for living water. And she can't understand how he can drink clean water if he doesn't have a bucket. And she doesn't understand what living water is. And so it's quite comical. And he, she thinks Jesus is a little bit crazy because he didn't bring a bucket. And, he, and Jesus also violates all kinds of rules of etiquette. Men do not initiate conversations with women in public spaces, and yet Jesus does that. He says hello first. And he also, being a Jew, says hello to a Samaritan. It would be right now like a Ukrainian saying hello to a Russian, or a Russian saying hello to a Ukrainian. That's just not done. And so they banter back and forth, and the bantering and the light flirtation leads to a deep theological discussion. I don't know if you've ever started a conversation in a coffee shop and you've said, hello, how's your day going? And then before you know it, you're having a deep discussion about God or about how the church is going. Sometimes we have to talk about our faith through, uh, through the side door. And in this place, their bantering leads to some deep conversation. And in this story, which we didn't read all the way through because it goes to 42 verses, the woman grows from saying hello to Jesus and kidding him about not having a, a bucket for his water to, as you heard Carolyn say, she proclaimed Jesus as Messiah. She recognized him as the Messiah. The constant conversation helped her grow. She became an evangelist. She goes back to her neighborhood and says, hey, I've met the Messiah. She's a messenger for Jesus. Unlike the story of Nicodemus in chapter 3, Jesus and the Samaritan woman talk in these public places instead of hiding out in the course of the night. He's credentialed, he's a high-ranking Pharisee, and so he doesn't let his colleagues know that he's having a conversation with Jesus. The Samaritan woman is not embarrassed, she's not worried about what others are thinking. And so they talk. But both of them do grow in their faith. The next time we see Nicodemus and John, he is standing up for Jesus and claiming that he's, Jesus is about to be given an unjust, unfair trial. And Nicodemus stands up as part of the Sanhedrin and says, hey, no, this is not just, this is not fair. Jesus and the woman are interdependent on one another. And that's another insight about our faith and about growing the church and growing in our relationship. We need each other. And 
we need to help one another meet the basic human needs. And this is where she and Jesus really meet. The basic human need for clean water, as Helen talked about, there's Helen, becomes the moment for encountering Christ. The basic need for water becomes the opportunity to encounter Christ. And we, the church, are called to be the ones who take drinking water and also living water to communities around the world, both in our neighborhoods here and in the far-flung places of the planet. One third of human beings around the world lack access to clean drinking water. It's one of the greatest human needs and crises. We must figure out ways to sanitize water so that people can have a drink. Jesus breaks open the boundaries between Jews and Samaritans. And so the quickest way home to Galilee might be through Samaria, but there's a, more, a deeper reason for doing that, and that's to bring the people who've been separated and alienated from each other for so long to bring them back together and to bring the despised outsiders and the alienated Samaritans into the kingdom of God where there are no outsiders. We are all insiders in God's realm of grace. There are no outsiders. We're all in. No one standing outside the house staring into the, through the window wanting to be let in. My dear mother, blessed be she, was the president of her sorority during World War II at the University of Missouri. And during rush week in the fall of 1944, all these young pretty women wanting to join a sorority uh, visited several sororities of their choosing and the ones who would invite them to uh, candidate, you might say, for membership in the sorority. And the set of twins, gorgeous, personality plus, they were part of Rush Week. And they toured Alpha Gamma Delta, the sorority where mom was president. And the entire sorority voted to admit them. They, were, they just had the personality that their sorority needed. And then upon clear, closer evaluation of the application, the membership discovered that these twins were Jews. And the sorority had a rule. Christians only, no Jews allowed. And my mother called for a chapter meeting and she said, we are fighting a world war over this issue right now. And she said, I recommend we, we break that rule, we violate that boundary. And she said, I'm going to write a letter to the national headquarters, not asking for their permission because we're gonna do it anyway, but we'll give them the courtesy of knowing that this is what we're doing. And their decision to admit the Jewish twins stood. That boundary was broken wide open. These are the kinds of boundaries that Jesus wants us to open up. He discards the traditional boundaries between women and men and various ethnic groups and religious groups and political parties. We live in a world starkly divided into camps. There are walls, there are, there are fences, there's even a fence around cemeteries. That's always puzzle because who can get out? And all of these divisions are pulling apart the threads that bind us together as a nation. The threads are frayed. Fear and prejudice build walls and fences and policies and procedures that keep us apart, but compassion and grace and hospitality, all those traits in this passage, place gates in the fences and build bridges across borders, 
In the Gospel of John, Jesus doesn't only offer a gate, he becomes the gate in chapter 10 through whom we go in and out to enjoy life. We are the ambassadors and servants of Christ who go into so-called enemy territory and bring and proclaim compassion and healing and grace. We take good news to the forgotten people like the Samaritan woman who has no name but who is hungering for living water. Jesus opens wide the gate of God's kingdom of grace. And as Romans remind us, he is the one through whom we obtain access to this grace in which we stand. And this is the way that we stand in our lives, is through God's grace. And we've obtained access to Christ, the one who is the living water, who is the gate, the door, the good shepherd, the Messiah. Let us open up our arms of compassion and let us lead people to that living water that gives life to all. Amen. Before we sing the hymn, I want to do a moment for mission and UCC history. You'll see at the top of the bulletin that this is Amistad Sunday. Amistad Sunday is observed on the second Sunday of March every year. In 1839, Africans were captured off the west coast of Africa and placed on a slave ship bound for the United States. The name of the ship was Amistad. And the enslaver wanted to head to the south of the United States. That and Cuba, where these Africans would be sold into slavery. Well, they got wind of what was going to happen to them, and you may have seen Spielberg's movie, and they mutinied, killed the lead enslaver, and took over the ship, and wound up off the coast of Long Island, where they were arrested, but then they were released, and the sh ship went to uh, Connecticut, to uh, New London where the plantation owner was set free, but the, the enslavers who had, I mean the slaves who had killed the, the lead enslaver on the ship were arrested for murder. Well, some Congregationalists in the New England churches around there got wind of this. They were also abolitionists, and they organized a committee to free these future slaves who they thought were unjustly captured in Africa and brought here against their will. And to make a story relatively shorter, the case went all the way to the Supreme Court where former President John Quincy Adams argued the case before the Supreme Court, which consisted mainly of enslavers. But the Supreme Court ruled in favor of the Africans and said they should be sent home. They, they docked in a free state and so they were not slaves. And that little committee of Congregationalists became the foundation for our homeland ministries, which is still active today. And so that's why we observe Amistad Sunday. Let us sing, Fill My Cup, Lord. And then I heard my Savior speaking. 
be seated. Are there any joys or concerns we need to share this morning, need to lift up? Let us now come before God in both spoken and silent prayer. Let us pray. Gracious and merciful God, whose mercy is beyond measure and whose grace is generous beyond our counting, we come before you this day mindful of our need for your grace and aware that we are not as merciful both to others and to ourselves as we ought to be. We are amazed at how forgiving and how giving you are to us every day. So open all our senses that we might become aware anew of the gifts that we receive day after day, hour after hour, minute after minute. We know, O oh God, that there are many of our brothers and sisters and kindred around the world who lack the basic necessities of life. And so inspire us to open wide our arms of compassion and our pockets of plenty that others might ha have and receive life's necessities. We remember this day all those people who need your gift of healing, who need to feel your touch, and who need to be lifted up by your arms because they are weak and overburdened in mind, body, and or spirit. And in our hearts, in this moment, we name them. And we lift them up to you. And in this holy, sacred hour, we <clears throat> speak to you from the depths of our hearts to the depths of your heart, O oh God, naming those people and issues that are too precious to say aloud. Now, O oh God, we join together in praying the prayer that Christ taught us to pray down through the ages and around the world. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I want to thank all of you on behalf of St. John's for your continued generosity. There are many ways in which you can give. Your stewardship does make a difference. You can give here at church. You can give online, or you can stop by the office, or you can mail it in. We need to be regular stewards of God's grace because even though we might go on vacation occasionally, God never rests. Let us stand and join in singing the doxology and remain standing for the prayer of dedication and the closing hymn.
Let us pray. Our spiritual ancestors offered sacrifices to glorify you, O God. So would we honor you by these gifts. May they express the depth of our love for you. As your church, we put them to work on your behalf in programs of outreach toward those who long for meaning as well as for life's basic necessities. Grant your joy to all who give and all who receive. Amen. and good cheer. Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the oppressed. Love all persons and love and serve the Lord and the blessings of God, Creator, Christ, and Holy Spirit be with you all this day and always. Amen. I need you. Thank you. 